the many future community, distinguished guests, dear minister. Uh, I, my name is Linus Eriksonas. I represent the coordinating partner in the consortium, which is actually implementing the FP7 project uh, for organizing this conference under the leadership of Henrikus Mikolaitis and Professor Ria Toko. So the organizers asked me to address two questions today, and this is the third time in six years that I'm, uh, I have to address those uh, issues, uh, uh, and I have to admit that these questions are really tough, and uh, no clearly cut answers I can promise you today. So first time I was asked uh, to answer those questions was back in 2009 when uh, DG Connect, or by that time it was known as DG Inso, was running a big technology audit exercise across the new EU member states and the associate countries in order to understand why the performance and participation of SMEs and research institutions from this region is lagging. Then, two years later, when we were preparing uh, the integration into the European Space Agency, again, people from the space sector uh, asked to investigate uh, the same issues around participation, lack of participation, or uh, feasibility as related to FP7 space security programs. So most of the answers that I'll give today are some of the thoughts are actually based on the insights that I gained for the last five years in analyzing in-depth ICT program and space program. So today I will talk about levels of participation of industry players, both small and large ones, from Central and Eastern European countries in FP7 collabor collaboration thematic areas, the areas which are key to key enabling technologies. So I'll show some data. We'll, we can discuss them, uh, track record. I will sort of focus on the hypothesis assumptions which trying to explain the lagging participation from this region. And then I'll go in depth and analyze types of participants by ownership. We'll look at domestic and foreign capital controlled entities. We'll look at the uh, impact of size, where the size can impact on the participation and involvement in the networks, whether this is a game for really big industry players or the small players linked to the big players uh, in the industrial heartlands of in Europe. And then we'll look into participant roles in consortia and ask ourselves a very simple question. What type of jobs do they get in uh, factory for future projects? What type of jobs and tasks do they get in the collaborative research projects in other CATS-related uh, uh, consortia? And then, of course, some of you have met, uh, some from EFRA asked me, will you provide some strategies for involvement of industry partners from, from this region? I'm not sure that I will be able to provide exact guides uh, or guidelines, but uh, perhaps uh, take this as, as an as a insight from someone who's been uh, working for over 10 years in bringing in industry, high-tech ventures, and uh, uh, manufacturers into collaborative networks in Europe. So first, let's have a look at the share of funding received by SMEs and FP7 cooperation program. The European Commission is very happy with the figure. They say the EC target is met, it's about 15% of SME participants. Uh, the, the, the other issues which are not analyzed uh, by the monitoring reports that we read from the Commission is uh, what type of roles the SMEs display, what type of uh, budgets are allocated to them, but the participation numbers are quite okay. If we look at the share of SE contribution received by SMEs from this region, comparing to the total share of funding, co-funding received by SMEs, we see that um, participation, uh, the participation of the um, SMEs from this region does not yield a lot of financial benefits for them. 
we see that in, uh, on average, an FP7 cooperation programs, they get 6% comparing to, uh, from the total of received by SMEs. And it's a kind of five to 6% is kind of a, an average across the cooperation program. In factors of the futures, uh, I haven't calculated all the data because I, I analyzed only 74 out of 150, but it's roughly, it's about 3%. So it's not much really, it amounts to only three, five, seven percent of the budget received by all SME participants. Uh, so, but if, if we look at the involvement and the eagerness of partners from this region to participate uh, in, cooperation program. So we see this, they're very, very eager. Participation levels in CATS relevant FP7 cooperation thematic areas is as high as of the countries uh, EU 12, or 15, and even higher in NMP. For example, the participation level of SMEs from Lithuania in NMP program is above 40%. In ICT, in Factors of the Futures, we see a high number of participants trying, uh, uh, trying to, uh, are e eager to participate and um, join the joint efforts uh, to reindustrialize Europe. And we see a very clear explanation why is this happening. The, uh, the, the, the manufacturing base is still very much in this region. Uh, again, the officials uh, on the first day of the conference very much emphasized that you are okay, you have 20%, almost 20% uh, manufacturing contribution to GDP. But as we spoke, as, we, as we've spoken today with uh, colleagues from Poland who work with manufacturing industry there, there is a re really challenge that these that this situation might not be sustained on the long run because there's only low labor intensive processes and manufacturing businesses are relocated to countries like Poland. If they are not get enough uh, uh, and renewed uh, their manufacturing facilities within the next five to 10 years, we've, we might face a challenge really here. So officially, when you see at the reports and analysis produced for the commission, by the commission, we see two explanations based mostly on a hypothesis. The first one, it's very typical. You can hear it in the corridors of, in Brussels, everywhere. The assumption is this is a lagging is due to overall economic performance. There's not much we can do about it. The interim assessment report, on the research PPPs in the European Economic Recovery Plan 2011 says, the participation pattern largely mirrors the most economically active nations in the relevant industrial sectors and areas, which perhaps also provides confirmation of the industrial relevance of the research PPPs. So you are performing or misperforming, underperforming, and that reflects uh, the figures that we get from the participation. Second hypothesis uh, is more nuanced. Based on the analysis that von Hofer did in 2012, which says that the lagging is country specific, and country specific because each country has a differently aligned uh, research and uh, innovation support, uh, support system. And they say no evidence for the existence of country clusters regarding FP7 participation could be found. A single depiction of a Central Eastern European member state does not make sense as the initial situation as the as well as the transformation and post-transformation processes of the individual states differ significantly. I don't have time to analyze in depth these hypotheses, but I'll, I'll run some quick and dirty ch checks on that. A uh, first, a quick check, uh, hypothesis one, participation equals lagging economies. So if we see indeed, in terms of EC contribution, this region contributes very little uh, it still is a, a, a receiver of benefits through the cohesion policy. But in terms of participant numbers, perhaps there is something true in that, that uh, larger economies then generate more participants. But again, when we look at production and sold value from the total manufacturing output, we see a very sort of um, unclear picture. It's, uh, you cannot say that the whole region is, is uh, monolithic. And perhaps the hypothesis that uh, 
Fraunhofer formulated back 2012 that this is participation is country specific has something in it. So let's check it. Uh, we see that when we analyze the collaborative links uh, between different countries, and this is only a fragment of this uh, very interesting matrix which was put into the final uh, six frameworks program seven report which came out just in August 2013. So this is a huge, uh, a huge matrix which shows very clearly that indeed we have some uh, tendencies, the heartlands, the industrial heartlands of Europe, they, uh, they tend to be linked in uh, collaborative efforts closer than the rest of, uh, of Europe on its periphery. So when they then visualize this, we clearly identify that there is this heartlands of uh, industrial Europe linked uh, to certain peripheries and then the rest are um, sort of developing on their own. So let's check the hypothesis too. Perhaps this participation is really country unique and specific. And I've checked um, participation of companies and R&D institutions in uh, future, future for factory schools. I didn't have time to go through all the 150. So I analyzed 74 projects uh, and then 38 out of them contain some of participants from the region with allocation budget of something like 5%. When we break down the participation according to the type of institution, we see, that, uh, we see very clearly that there are leaders, uh, Hungary, Slovenia, and Poland. But the only one leader actually in Hungary which has very uh, uh, sort of science and industry participant profile very clearly. And we know because of the uh, automotive cluster in Budapest uh, uh, with very strong efforts to cluster research uh, institutions, they have this result. So when we look at this, we maybe say maybe participation about foreign capital controlled entities and we hear these anecdotal stories. So I wanted to check and um, see what evidence can, can tell it. So I, I've done some basic hierarchical sort of clustering. So I took these 26 industry participants who are participating, who've been participating in 38 projects out of 74 FOF projects that are analyzed. And we see it's 17 SMEs, nine large ones. And in terms of foreign domestic control, capital control, we don't have a clear answer really. We have four different types of players really involved. So I wanted to look deeper, so I checked everything I could. I checked the turnover number of uh, staff they have, everything they, I could uh, take data from publicly available sources. So I can come up with four profiles. The four profiles of your typical, if you like, typical participant in uh, these kind of projects. So two types for SMEs. So one SME type is domestic capital, micro or small SME turnover, something from around 1 million to 6 million euros. Uh, mostly second tire supplier, medium capital, medium labor intensive. So they usually are uh, well located on the logistical routes closer to the industrial heart of, of Europe, supplying multinationals, CNC machining, CAD, some software. Second SME type is a foreign control SME. It's what you call it an outsourced business in a low capital, medium to high capital intensive services, usually software services, back end office operations. Then they have a turnover of up to 40 million euros supplying foreign own holding companies. So these type of two SMEs. So if you're one of those and you have, and I will say something about the conditions we needed uh, for entering these networks. And large enterprises, again, there's no clear, clear answer that the large enterprise has to be foreign corporation. It could be local, but the important thing is there has to be a global leader, industry leader and uh, uh, with a strong market presence globally. So large enterprise, type one, domestic capital controlled, global commodity producer, 
high capital, low labor intensive, for example, in the white goods manufacturing, large enterprise, uh, type two, relocated manufacturing, foreign capital control, high capital intensive, medium labor intensive, and these are exclusively in three areas, automotive, industrial automation, oil and gas, or resource. Uh, so when we look at roles of participant companies from this region and consortia, we see this kind of, what kind of jobs they get. They go and get this kind of jobs. So roles for SMEs are basically end user, some demonstration activities, they do some software work, CAM development, CNC metal processing forming. Usually they are second tier suppliers. They, are, they do some testing, field testing. And roles for large enterprises, some component development, some validation. Automot for automotive manufacturing, industrial automation, wild good, gas, and oil. So how to become better involved in industrial R&D consortia? So, uh, these are sort of not the recipes for success, but they are indications of where you can sort of guide your, your strategic alignment within the Horizon 2020, and especially within the Horizon 2020 industrial pillar. First thing is, key number one thing is participation supply networks of multinationals or global, global industries as a supplier or as a channel. They're very keen to get access to the Eastern markets, and they come to us and they say, yes, if you can act as a channel to Russia, then, okay, we can, we can make a deal, we can involve you, and we can become also partners in the consortium. Medium capital intensive, medium labor intensive processes, and ad advantages of logistics and loca location. Of course, we are in a disadvantage here in this country that we are far away from industrial heartlands so we have to come up with the Baltic Industrial Belt Initiative which is uh, our way of uh, getting access to the, or realigning us logistically better uh, towards our um, neighboring markets in Scandinavia. And for large enterprises, there are still large enterprises in this region. They're, they're there in Poland, in Hungary, across the region. They need, to, they need to have that kind of profile. Industrial leadership in high capital, medium and high capital labor processes or consumer goods production for global markets or control of natural energy resources, oil and gas. But there is a condition, there is a bottom line for all of this. You have to participate in clustered initiatives together with RTUs. And I've, I've, I've talked to uh, Afro people and they, they also emphasize that the participation of RTUs and, and the RTUs acting as a channels to get across to the to the SMEs regionally is a key issue. And of course, uh, as one of the co-organizers of this event, I should say that participating in such networking activities as the many future conferences and related activities also can be a bonus and benefit. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>